In the past eight or nine months that I've been at Heschel, you have all had the opportunity to get to know me in one way or another. What you may not have known until today is that I am a grandchild of Holocaust survivors, two of the most amazing people you will ever meet, whose lives were devastated because a group of fanatical people were able to convince much too much of Eastern Europe that we were so much of a threat to their existence, we needed to be annihilated. Even if you do not have a direct tie to the Holocaust, by being here, by making it important to get a Jewish education and live your lives Jewishly in one way or another, each and every one of you are living testimonies to the ultimate failures of our adversaries. By our living, we give honor to those who suffered and did what they could to persevere. We are fortunate to live during a time when Holocaust survivors are in our midst. And as long as they are willing to be here and tell us their stories, we need to be here to listen, to make sure we and the world never forgets. With that, I would like to introduce you to my grandmother, Molly Sperling. She was born in Krakow, Poland in 1926, the youngest of three children. Her father was a successful business owner, and suffice it to say, she was able to live a pretty comfortable life prior to the war. In 1939, when my grandmother was 13 years old, Germany invaded Poland, and life as she and her family knew it ceased to exist. Evident by her being here today, she is very receptive and eager to share her experiences. It is not uncommon for her to share her stories with me as I ask her questions while we are visiting with one another in New Jersey. This will continue today, but instead of a couch in her house, or my parents' kitchen table as what happened at over Pesach, we'll be here on this stage to share this moment with all of you. Without further ado, a conversation about the Holocaust with a survivor grandmother and her granddaughter. Hi, Bubby. Hi. So why don't we start from the beginning? I know you had a pretty wonderful life. life. There we go. I know you had a pretty wonderful life before the war. And as I mentioned, you are from Krakow. But can you tell us a little bit more about it? How many siblings you had? I kind of gave that away, too. Where you went to school, school, and what type of uh, life your family led? Well, we lived a, a pretty comfortable life before the war. Uh, I had a sister, Pestle, and a brother, Yaakov. Uh, I was the youngest. Um, I went to school, to Hebrew school. Uh, our household was uh, very orthodox. Uh, we observed every uh, Jewish detail that needed to be done on Shabbat, Shabbat and on Yom Tov. And uh, we sang Zmirot around the, around the table uh, at mealtime. It was just a good life. As I mentioned, things changed in 1939 when Germany invaded Poland. And a couple of years later, you and your family, uh, along with the whole Krakow Jewish community, were forced to move to the Krakow ghetto. And you certainly had to make a lot of adjustments. But fortunately, you were able to be with your family for the majority of that time you were there. Um, but unfortunately, that didn't last long. No, it didn't. Uh, well, before we went to the ghetto, we had uh, a lot of uh, um, discrimination, and already uh, the Nazis were um, doing a lot of bad things to Jews. Uh, they posted um, the storefronts were painted with a Jewish star. Nobody could shop there. The Jewish the schools for Jewish children were closed. Uh, the schools were closed. Um, uh, and my father's business was taken away, taken over by a Nazi, uh, and he couldn't even enter it. Um, and, um, well, you want to know about the ghetto. There was a lot that came before the ghetto, but then time came that they built in a certain time of, a certain uh, part of town, um, a ghetto. The ghetto was, surrounded by a six-foot-high wall with one entrance. 
that was always guarded by the Germans, by the Nazis. Uh, people were going to forced labor out of, out of the ghetto, uh, but always on the way back they were searched. And if somebody wanted to smuggle in a potato or something because the hunger was great, uh, they were shot or taken away. The living conditions in ghetto um, uh, are very, very hard to describe. We were crowded in one little apartment, had at least three or four families. And we, um, to have a little privacy, we used to hang uh, we hung uh, blankets to have our little spaces, private spaces. But everybody had to work. Um, there were also raids. Uh, that was the worst thing, because uh, the Nazis used to um, barge in even in the middle of the night, looking for children and old people, and take them away, because they just wanted people able to work to be alive, otherwise we couldn't. They wouldn't let us live. Um, one night, Continue. one night they barged into our house. I happened to sleep with my grandmother in the same bed, and uh, she was, well, she was probably in her early 60s. To me, she was very old because I was a young child, and. I told her not to breathe because I was afraid that they're going to take her away. But they didn't find her, thankfully, that night, and they just left. Um, so then, eventually, the, the ghetto was, was liquidated. Well, we were, there, were, there were two liquidations, because one was uh, to make the ghetto smaller. There was one liquidation, and uh, that's when they took my parents and my sister away uh, because we all had yellow ID cards with numbers and the word Jude, Jew, and um, whoever had certain numbers had to, had to uh, go to a, um, a square. And, um, and we all thought my, my parents and my sister had these numbers and they thought they were told they were going to be taken to work. Instead, um, as we found out later, um, they took them away in cattle cars. And much, much later, we found out that they went to the camp, the destruction camp, Belgians. That's how I lost. And I lost left, I was left with my brother in the ghetto. And so you were together with your, your brother. But then the, the ghetto was completely liquidated. And that was the second liquidation. And yes, the ghetto was liquidated. And that was uh, a day that I will never forget. Uh, there was a lot of killing, a lot of blood running down the street, um, children torn away from parents' hands. And um, it was just a horrible, horrible day. Young people like myself, I was by then about 15, um, were taken to a camp, um, nearby camp, my first camp, which was Plashov. It was shown, if anybody saw Schindler's List, it was, that was the ghetto, and that was the, the, the camp. And, and, what, and you, what happened to your brother? Because you were with your brother, but your brother didn't make it. I, I was much. separated from my brother, and I had no idea what happened to him. To this day. I had no idea. After the war, somebody told me that he ended up in Auschwitz, but he did not survive. So as you mentioned, you went to Plajov, which was a work, a labor camp, correct? A labor camp. A labor camp outside of Krakow. Right. Um, and it was on top of a Jewish cemetery, just it, you know, kind of to stick it to us. But, uh, and as you said, well, I, that it was featured in the film of Schindler's List. And in it, Ray Fiennes played Amon Get. Is that how it's pronounced? Get, um, who was a camp com commandant. And he was known for being uncommonly sadistic in uh, his treatment of and killing of uh, prisoners. But you to you've told me several times the chilling tale of the surprise interaction you had with the real Amon Get. Well, yeah. Uh... We had to work one week night. The one week, sh one, sh one week was nighttime, and one week was daytime, day shift. 
that particular week, I was on a day shift. I was working, making brushes. We all had the signed uh, things to do, to work for, the, for their work effort. That's why they kept us alive, just to be able to, to work for them. I was on a day shift that time, and um, I needed to go to the bathroom. Uh, and my friend and I went. Uh, the bathroom was a little bit away. It was a separate barrack uh, with, 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 with seats and, and whatever. In that place, the woman that took care of the, of the it's called, it was called a train. Um, she told us that Amon Get, the commandant of our ghetto, the Nazi, was walking around in the, play, in the ba between the barracks where people were working. So we thought, well, we don't want to confront him. We don't want to come near him. So we went on the other side where the barracks where we slept. And so we went towards the barracks where we slept. And as we were walking there, he comes across. He was a tall man in his uniform with two Great Dane dogs with a whole entourage. Um, and we, the two girls, were stopped. And he said, where are you going? And I had enough in my mind to say that, and I spoke German very well, I said, um, we, are, I'm on the night, we are on the night shift and we needed to go to the latrine. So he hit us both with a, with a um, whip and let us go. We ran up to the, bar to the barracks where we slept because we were afraid to go back to the uh, work barracks because it was known that he, people were saying that he remembered people's faces. And we hid on the top, top uh, barrack bunk, not to be seen. But then we found out that whoever he met after us, he killed instantly, just shot them. So that was one time that I guess it was meant for me to live, as were many more times that I had. And we'll, we'll hear more about those stories in a bit. After about a year of your time uh, at Plashov, it came to an end, and as typical for many victims, you were transferred to another camp. Of course, the transfer was no walk in the park. Yes. That time, I was on the night shift, working in that brush factory. Uh, a few Nazis uh, broke open the doors with guns blazing, shot a few people at random, and the rest of us were taken out of the work barrack. It was November. It was cold. It was partially snowing. It was just the weather was terrible. I just had this little dress on, and so did others. And we were taken to the trains, not knowing where we were going. The train was not a train. It, there were kettle cars waiting for us. Um, we were shoved in with almost no space to almost, you could just stand. There was no space to move or sit down or anything. And it was already evening. Wind was blowing, it was cold, freezing. And the train started going, uh, not knowing where we were going. Uh, I don't remember how long we were on the train, but, um, People are crying and screaming, gasping for air. Finally, we arrived at night. And when we got off the train, the cattle car, we realized we are in a forest. And we started walking. They pushed us to walk. Now, walking was not just walking. They, they used to yell at us, go, 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 yell. We had to run. We had no strength. We had no, because we were emaciated and hungry always hungry. Then in the morning, and they, we, finally we reached some barracks. It was nighttime, so we didn't know what it was. We laid down on the bunk beds, which were just um, wood, three-tier bunk beds, wo uh, just, just wood and one blanket. Morning, when we woke up, we couldn't believe our eyes. There were 
people walking around looking like corpses. Their faces were yellow, greenish yellow. And it was, and the barrack was filthy dirty. There were bed bugs and had lice crawling all over the place. We all got typhus there because of the dirt. That was a bomb factory. Uh, of course, every day we had to uh, assemble first on a square. They counted us for hours. And then we had to walk to the place, to the place where the bombs were ma manufactured. Well, typhus wasn't an easy thing to, to overcome. But somehow, just like you said before, you, that was just another sign for, for you to survive. <sighs> um, but uh, eventually, just like in pleasure of your time at this factory was over, and you were transferred to another bomb factory from the same company, but in Germany. You had been in Poland this whole time, and you were transferred to a, a bomb factory in Germany. And similar to the, this previous camp, conditions were still pretty unbearable. Um, but amidst the pain and anguish and the harsh treatment of the Nazis, you were able to experience a particularly uplifting moment. Well, that was, uh, that was a, a, a night that we called almost a miracle. Um, you have to know the conditions that were there. Uh, we had to walk far away to the, to the factory where the bombs were manufactured. We were guarded by Nazis, German Shepherd dogs, that at a uh, command used to tear us up. We couldn't even move around, just walk. Um, I worked 12 hours a day. Just got a slice of bread and a little watery soup. That was our food. Um, one night, we somehow knew that it was Yom Kippur. I don't know how we did, because there was no, no way of any, we didn't know what, anything about the outside world. We had a, a, bar a barrack overseer, a woman, a large woman, who was very mean, very mean to us. After 8 o'clock, the lights were off, and nobody could even whisper. If somebody did, she yelled at them and beat them and beat us and all that. That particular night, when the lights were off, everything was quiet, somebody started humming a Jewish song. And we waited all scared. What is this woman going to do to us? But it was quiet. She didn't do anything. Then another one started singing a Hebrew song, a prayer. Then another one. And we went on for a while like this. And this woman didn't even get up, didn't raise her voice. And we couldn't understand till today. I really don't understand why she was quiet. Maybe she had a lot of guilty feelings. Because after all, she was human. And that was my story. That was very uplifting to us because life was really unbearable. Well, you were at this camp towards the end of 1944, um, and that was when the, the Russians were starting to advance on Germany, or was it both the Russians and Americans? Bo Russians are from both sides, okay. Americans. So, uh, and, the, and the American b bombers were bombing. Right, so Germany was being bombed, um, and you were able to see the planes, but liberation for you didn't come right away. Um, you managed to find yourself on uh, one of the infamous death marches. And um, which, of course, many people did not survive. But obviously, you're, you're standing here, and, and you did survive. So what, what do you attribute to, to your survival of that experience? <laughs> I have no idea. It was just meant for me to be alive, I guess. I don't know how I survived, and why am I? The, uh, that's my question that I ask myself every single day of, the, of my life. Why am I the only one? from my entire family, uncles, aunts, cousins, brothers, sisters, parents. 
that I survived? I have no idea. I cannot answer this question. Well, you had told me that you, you managed to escape from the line a couple of times to go in. There were potato fields. You were passing potato fields, and you managed to well, escape. Well, we were on the death, death march. Uh, when the Russian, the, the Americans were bombing very strongly, and, and uh, we, prisoners, ran out of the building, of the barracks, because we were happy to see the bomb. We didn't care. We just didn't, it, and one bomb hit, hit uh, buildings. But we just didn't care. We just were happy to see the bombs coming down. And um, they took us out of the camp because the armies were advancing very quickly from both sides. And bombing was, was also very constant. We were walking. Um, that was called a death march because nobody, anybody sat down for five minutes, was shot. We were just walking without, with guarded by the Nazis and by the dogs, and we didn't know where we were going. A lot of people did sit down because they just couldn't walk anymore. I was walking with my friend and her mother who, who really, couldn't sit down, and, and we pulled her up and, and dragged her with us. There were, it was late March, early or April, and there were some, we passed some potato, potato fields that were planted. And we tried to sneak out and pull out some of the planted potatoes to eat if we could, because there was nothing there. A lot of people were shot for it. Uh, and uh, there were walls of fire around us. The fronts were coming very closely. Their aim was to bring us to the nearest destruction camp, but they couldn't because the wall, the fight, the bombs. I mean, the the fighting was too close, and they couldn't do it. There were walls of fire around us. So then, uh, since that was happening, there was a surprising end to your to your death march? Well, finally, finally, they locked us up in a barn. Um, it was not far from the River Elba, where it was a historic place because uh, the Americans and Russian troops met, fighting from both sides. Um, they locked us up in a barn. We were about, I would say, I don't know, about a few hundred young girls like myself and young women. Um, and, and they just left us there. Oh, we're, sit, we're sitting in the barn, and all of a sudden, everything was quiet. No bombs erupting, no fire, nothing, no shouting from the Nazis. We figured, are we going to die here in this barn? So we had to break down the wall somehow. I don't know how we did this, but we broke open the door. And we found ourselves on an estate that was an est somebody's estate. Um, and they had like barbecue oven on outside and, and full of potatoes, loads of potatoes. Well, that was, we started eating these potatoes. And that's, that's how we got out of that barn. We were sitting in this barn and few, and we saw Nazi uniforms strewn all over the ground. So we figured they ran away. A few, few days later, Russian, I was on the Russian side of the River Elba, and I was liberated by the Russian army, and the Russian tanks were coming down the dirt road where we were. So we knew we were liberated, but um, with nowhere to go. Just as you said, there, there was nowhere for you to go. You were, as far as you knew, and as it turned out, all, all alone, the, the sole survivor of your family. Um, but you did end up. I didn't know that I'm the sole survivor. Right. At, the, at this point, you didn't know. But, no. um, but you didn't know what to do. But you ended, you ended up at a displaced persons camp in Austria yeah. um, called Bindermichel. Yeah. And something very special happened <sighs> at this displaced persons camp. Well. At this camp, I met my husband, who is here with me, who is a survivor of six different concentration camps. 
thankfully and gratefully, we are here together. Um, we got married in that camp, and we had a little boy uh, who now lives in California, who is your uncle. And um, they live in California, as I said. And that's what happened in Bindermichel. And then in 1949, uh, and in then April, in, in 19, for April 1949, uh, my ago. husband had an uncle here in the United States who sent us a visa. It was very hard for Jews to immigrate even then. The Jewish quota was always very small. And, um, but my husband had an uncle who sent us a visa, as I said. Uh, we were interrogated by the CIA. We had to have complete medical checkups till they let us go. And finally we did. We came to the United States on April 1st, 1949. We consider this the luckiest day of our lives. And then a couple of years later, something even more important happened. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. In 1940, well, 1949, 1952, 1952, I gave birth to her, <laughs> to her mom. I think it's important. <laughs> it is important. Well, I didn't forget about it. It's just that <laughs> somehow it doesn't tie in with my Holocaust story. Well, but. that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, okay, it's good. We can, but we it can was end. a happy happening. And as, I, as you see the fruit here, we have a wonderful, wonderful granddaughter, and she has a sister who is just as wonderful. We have two grandchildren in California, with my, uh, my, our son and our daughter-in-law, who all, thank God, continue in their Jewish life. Uh, and we are just very grateful for this. Well, <laughs> that, that was a, a very funny ending to this otherwise harrowing story. And um, a very happy one, also. And I'm very humbled to be a part of this happy ending and so honored to um, and so lucky to have you and, and Zeta as, as my grandparents. And um, as we're running out of minutes, I wanted to thank you for coming in today and sharing your stories. But not only sharing your stories, you're sharing a very special day with us today. Oh, thank you. Because today happens to be her birthday. So hold on, hold on. <laughs> So just for, for double the thing. Oh, my goodness. Go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me give you a hug. So I, I, wanna I thank... just want to say a few words. I just want to say a few words in conclusion. It does my heart <laughs> so good to be in this Jewish wonderful school. When we left, we lost is estimated a million and a half beautiful, beautiful children during the Shoah. And it just, I'm just so happy to be here and see the beautiful Jewish faces, a Jewish school, Jewish life thriving again. And I'm just grateful for it. So thank you for inviting me for being here. Thank you very much. Are we going? This is it. Yeah. You can, can keep it on. We're gonna... I'd like to thank Mrs. Sperling, Mr. Sperling, for coming in today and sharing time with us. We are we are honored and privileged to have you with us. I want you students for just one minute to close your eyes and fix this moment in your memories because nothing that you will ever read in a book about the Holocaust will be as alive as what you've heard today. We heard, I was struck by Mrs. Sperling saying that in the ghetto she slept in the same bed as her grandmother. And here we witness the link between Aviva and her great, great grandmother, because Mrs. Sperling can still remember her grandmother, what she looked like, what she spoke, 
and that's transmitted to Aviva and one day to Aviva's family. And I was also struck by how glibly we say, I'm hungry, I'm cold, I have so much work to do. So for one day, let's make it today. Let's be aware, super aware, of how fortunate we are, how lucky we are. I think um, a couple of months ago, the first time we were in this room, I said how lucky we are. And it was because we have this magnificent space. And today I say how lucky we are because we did not have that firsthand experience. And many of you know that uh, I'm sort of the link between, I'm like your mother, Aviva, the daughter of survivors, of Auschwitz survivors. My mother was on the death march from Auschwitz. And today is a day in which we connect generation to generation, children to adults, adolescents, you, I think what motivates many of us and keeps us in work with children is the vibrant energy, the vitality, the aliveness, of being among you, and that is the greatest antidote to the deafening silence of the loss of children. So for today, as you go through your day, try to feel how truly fortunate you are, and then go home tonight and make sure that you know your family's story, all of the details, all of the details. There's no detail small enough that it's unimportant. If you have grandparents, ask them what their favorite soup is if you don't know. What's their favorite ice cream flavor? Because the connection, the details will connect you to your immediate ancestors and you will have those details to one day connect your children to your family. And knowing your family's story, even when it's a difficult story, our researchers now tell us, helps you to navigate your life and makes your life meaningful. Thank you again to our wonderful and honored guests. Thank you. Thank you, Shmuel, and the Zachar class for giving us this wonderful program. <laughs>